Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. University of Wyoming professor Dr. Jeffrey Lockwood's new book, Behind the Carbon Curtain, The Energy Industry, Political Censorship, and Free Speech, explores censorship imposed by wealth and power, specifically from the energy industry and its influence in Wyoming. We'll visit with the author and also get the university's response from Chris Boswell, UW's Vice President for Governmental and Community Affairs. Behind the Carbon Curtain, next on Wyoming Chronicle. The book is called Behind the Carbon Curtain, The Energy Industry, Political Censorship, and Free Speech, authored by Dr. Jeffrey Lockwood. Dr. Lockwood, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Well, thank you for having me, Craig. You've been in Wyoming quite a long time. I'll read your bio. You've been here since 1986. You um, came here as a scientist, an insect e e ecologist at the University of Wyoming. And over the course of 20 years, you've changed into a professor of natural sciences and humanities with a joint appointment between the Department of Philosophy and the MFA program in creative writing. You currently teach courses in natural resource ethics, environmental justice, and the philosophy of ecology, along with other creative writing nonfiction workshops. So again, welcome. Thank you. Uh, this is an interesting book. It's a uh, difficult read for someone like me who is an alumni of the University of Wyoming. We want to think um, that our university is great, and this is, this is a, a hard look under the microscope of some tough issues. What was the genesis for Behind the, the Carbon Curtain? It began with uh, my involvement in the, um, we'll call it the case of, of uh, Carbon Sink, the, the artwork on campus um, that generated the, the pushback from the energy industry and from Wyoming politicians, which led to the destruction of that artwork under the order of the then University of Wyoming president. I was drawn into that because I, I, I'd come to know and was interviewed by and worked a little bit with the artist who, who, uh, who made that installation. Um, and so I wrote a couple pieces for Wildfile, trying to draw out what was happening on campus. And I thought I was done with the story of censorship at UW and in Wyoming, but then people started coming to me with stories, stories that they couldn't tell because they were at much more risk than I am as a tenured professor. And so I felt compelled to, uh, to tell their stories. And this was about in 2011 is when you really started working on the book. Exactly, exactly. Some might argue that censorship has existed not only at the University of Wyoming, but in other institutions for a long time, for hundreds of years. And so why are things different here? Well, it's interesting. I, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. And in the book, I argue that, um, that this is a long tradition, right, of, of censorship. Whenever there is a, um, uh, a, a distrib unequal distribution of power and wealth, those who have that power and wealth are going to have an intense interest in a pressing conversation that calls into, into question their power and wealth. And so we are part of a very long tradition. I, I say that, that the freedom of speech is a universal human right, but the tendency towards censorship is a universal human wrong. Right? So we aren't unique in some ways. But what makes us unique in terms of this book is that there's a kind of transparency in Wyoming because of our small size. There's a kind of clarity with regard to the cases that emerge in Wyoming. And so these cases are a lens, a vivid and intense look into the nature of censorship at a political and a university level. Um, but no, we aren't, we aren't unique. We're not, we're not worse than other places. That doesn't make it right. It just makes it clearer. And you argue in the book, certainly, that it doesn't make it right, yet it's you can't argue the influence that the energy industry has brought to the University of Wyoming for positive things either. No, absolutely. Um, and again, you know, I, I, I think of the energy industry um, as, as a kind of, well, it is, it's a corporate enterprise. Um, and corporations are, are not negative and they're not positive. Corporations, as I, as I contend, are amoral, right? We set them up with one duty and that duty is fiduciary. They do very well at that. Um, but they are not moral agents. Um, if we want them to behave in ways that are consistent with the public interest, then that's the role of regulation, that's the role of government, that's the role of the politicians to constrain um, this creature, 
that we made that has this single purpose. And so um, a lot of my concerns really um, are directed at those whose job it is to, um, to limit, constrain, and shape the behavior of um, uh, corporations that have essentially one function. And you go on to argue that at this university, speech is not free. Is that, is that really the basis for what you've written about? That's exactly it, right? Um, speech is not free. Speech um, has been argued not only by me, but by members of the, of, of the press. Um, speech is a commodity and has been commodified at the University of Wyoming, but it's been commodified nationally as well. Um, and it's something that you now pay for, um, that you have a right, in a sense, to shape speech, to shape public discourse, and you buy that right by virtue of your contra fiscal contributions to the University of Wyoming. To me, that undercuts the very nature, principles, and foundations of what it is to be a university. So with those fiscal contributions, if they didn't exist, could this university meet its mission? I think that's a valid question that people around Wyoming might ask. The private contributions are not essential in any way, shape, or form to the nature, function, and excellence of this university. Um, the taxes that are paid uh, via severance tax, mineral royalties tax, those are obviously essential to the state's income. About 70% of our state income comes from oil, gas, and coal. And about 70% of the university's Section 1 funds come from the state, right? Um, now let's get clear here for a moment, though, that those taxes are not paid by the energy industry. Um, any more than the local um, you know, stop and shop pays a, a, a sales tax. They collect a tax. And pass right, it on. And then pass it on. Um, and that tax, the sales tax is vital to, to the economy of a town. The energy taxes are vital to the economy of the state. So no, the, um, you know, it would be naive to say that, that the University of Wyoming and the state of Wyoming would not be where it is in the absence of that revenue. You talk very clearly about a systematic and pervasive effort to suppress free speech and scientific research here at the University of Wyoming, and that the industry, industry's bottom line is what has a chilling impact on science. Expand upon that. So the industry, um, for instance, via the School of Energy Research, the industry has funded um, a portion of the University of Wyoming. Um, and to the extent that the industry believes and the leadership of the university believes that that funding allows them to purchase the direction of research and development, we are, in a sense, bought. Um, now, one way of getting out from under that would be uh, the tenure process, where um, a scientist gains independence from that sort of external pressure. But Something that you benefit from. Exactly, but not all, not all researchers at the University of Wyoming benefit from that, and a number in the School of Energy don't. Um, their jobs are not protected. Their voice is not protected. They don't have the freedom that a tenured faculty member has. Now, it's a privilege, but it's also, in my mind, it's also a profound duty. It's a responsibility I have to the people of the state. Um, but yeah, there is influence, and the influence is, is not sort of uh, uh, by an industry. And I've, I received a great deal of industry funding when I was in the College of Agriculture. So I, I, my hands are not clean. I am not innocent. I'm actually fairly well experienced in what this looks like. And what it often looks like is a kind of self-censorship. Right? Rather than the industry, and I know of no industry that's ever told a scientist at the University of Wyoming, you have to mislead the public. But the presence of that money means that there's certain questions um, that I think we just choose to not ask, lines of research that we don't pursue. Um, and it's cutting off those lines of inquiry sort of by a, by a silence, by a self-censorship that really is sort of the insidiousness of the presence of that kind of money at this institution or any other. I want to read you something that I read in The Atlantic. And here's the quote, and then I'll give you its background, something you may be familiar with. Is, the question is not how many professors have been fired for, for their beliefs, but how many think they might be. Written in 1947 yeah. from the president of the University of Chicago. How, is that a prevailing um, thought here at the University of Wyoming today, in your view, that professors are worried to speak their minds? Is it that serious? I think there's two, yeah, at one level uh, prior to tenure, I think there is that deep worry, right? We're in, we're in a downsizing exercise. And is that the reason, or are the external influences and the power exerted by the energy industry? No, I think, it's, I think it's very much external influences. Um, you know, it, you don't want to stick your head up too high as an untenured faculty member at the University of Wyoming. You don't want to draw negative attention to the energy industry, 
um, or to the things that the energy industry is doing. Um, the other worry, even by, certainly among, among all faculty, tenured or untenured, is the allocation of resources. And so while, um, at least in presumably as a tenured faculty, I'm not subject to dismissal except under um, extreme circumstances, my program can be defunded, right? My job can be redescribed. My life can be made miserable. Um, and I think there's a lot of worry because we're looking at tens of millions of dollars of cuts to the university. And how are we going to allocate those cuts? Well, you know, if you're a problem-making faculty member in a problem-making department, I think what you have a sense of is that you are not going to be a winner in the reallocation of resources. Well, in full disclosure, your department right now is seeing some of that pressure. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. The, uh, the Department of Philosophy, for example, had all of its graduate assistantships pulled um, as part of the reallocation process. The Creative Writing Program, which has been a top 20 program in the nation, just saw its entire excellence fund, $300,000, vaporize. Um, and so real resources with real impacts to the quality Affecting of Affecting graduate assistants, correct. Graduate assistantships as well as visiting writers. Um, we, we let people go. Um, it, it's, had, it's having very serious impact. Now, can I draw a line between you know, the outspokenness of, of myself and my colleagues and these cuts? Um, I think it's not that direct, but it certainly does not put us in a good position um, in these times of declining budgets. Our current political environment um, leads to my next question. Same article in The Atlantic um, talks about whether parents have coddled their children to the point where students feel they should not be exposed to anything harmful um, to their psyche or to their beliefs. And is, is that something that you worry about, that students coming into the university all of a sudden don't want to reach out and explore in areas where they feel the hand that, that feeds them you know, might get chopped off? I think that's right. I think that's right. And, and you know, one of the things I want to point out here, as well as in the book, right, is that censorship, right, is not owned by the left or the right. It's not owned by Democrats or Republicans. It's not owned by anybody. It's owned by those with wealth and power, right? And if that wealth and power is coming from the left or from the right, um, what you're going to get is a suppression of speech. And so we see that on campuses, for example. You look at, at Berkeley recently, right, where they, they basically shut down a conservative uh, speech by a conservative uh, uh, guest. Um, you know, safe spaces, uh, you know, free speech zones on campus. And so the left is every bit as capable of censoring as is the right. The students who come to the University of Wyoming, it, it's kind of funny. They, you know, the, the expression, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds you seems quite pervasive. Um, and that worries me, that worries me deeply. Um, I tell our incoming graduate students from around the country that one of the best and one of the worst things about University of Wyoming undergraduates from our state is that they're very respectful of authority. Um, what that means is that you have a relatively easier time in the classroom, but what it also means is that um, getting them to confront the structures of power and wealth in this state is not something that they're highly practiced at. That scare you? It does. It does. It scares me a great deal, especially right now, because we look at the future of the energy industry, look at the future of, of coal, as, as was presented in a, in a very insightful seminar given by a visitor to the School of Energy Research, much, much to the credit of that, of that school. Um, it doesn't look good. Um, and if we are producing young people who are not practiced at asking hard, hard questions and having civil and intense discussions and arguments about Wyoming's future and our dependency on this, this one industry, this industry that in a sense has turned Wyoming into a company town with very long streets, then we are not preparing ourselves, we're not preparing our students, we're not preparing our future in a way um, that is going to allow the state to survive, let alone to flourish. I want to circle back to the origins of uh, you writing this book, The Carbon Sink Issue. National news, certainly news in Wyoming. What's changed since? Has reform happened in your eyes? Has the free speech issue improved, declined since? One would think that with all that, um, um, all that surrounded carbon sink, that things would have changed. How have they evolved? I don't think they have. Um, I think there's a, I mean, if you look at the history of the University of Wyoming, right, we had the controversy with textbooks in the 40s. We had 
We had, we had the Black 14. We had the controversies surrounding Mark Squalacci's work with the forest industry or the forest conservationists. We had the controversies surrounding Deb Donahue's right, a critique of, of, of grazing uh, on public lands in Wyoming. We have a long tradition, a great deal of institutional and cultural momentum um, in which there is um, censorship, there is the intrusion of the political and the economic forces on discourse at the University of Wyoming. Carbon Sink was, the, was a chapter in that. It's going to take a great deal of time, intensity, perseverance to turn that ship, um, given the momentum that the institution and the state have with regard to silencing um, uh, voices of opposition. Whose responsibility is that to begin to turn the course of the ship? In my opinion, I think it's the, re well, it's, it's everybody's responsibility. Some people, everybody has to decide what price they're going to pay to speak out. Um, and for a lot of people in Wyoming, I get it, right? They are employed in situations such that raising their voices and asking the hard questions has a tremendous potential cost to them. And so if you start looking at who has the freedom um, and in my mind, the, the, the duty to be raising their voice, I think it's tenured faculty within, within the state's uh, system of higher education. To me, the people of Wyoming have granted me the privilege of job security, and that comes with a tremendous responsibility, and that responsibility is for me to do my very best to tell them the truth, um, to raise my voice, because if I'm not doing that, um, then in what sense um, can I justify the protection and the privilege that they've given me of tenure at a university? The book is titled Behind the Carbon Curtain, The Energy Industry, Political Censorship, and Free Speech. We have a new administration, Dr. Lockwood, here at the University of Wyoming, relatively new. Um, Dr. Nichols has been the president here about a year. Do you, is there anything from your perspective that might give way to the university's uh, um, um, hope, if you will, of having more engaged conversation and less censorship of free speech, in your view? Well, it's, it, right now it's a, it's a two-sided coin. There's been some, some good talking of the talk. Um, the, the, the draft uh, uh, plan for the university talks about the importance of, of free speech and academic freedom. That's promising. But now we've got an instance, right? Are we gonna walk the walk? Um, I think many of your viewers are gonna be familiar with the recent conflict between uh, Senator Bouchard and students, as well as a faculty member who was threatened with uh, dismissal and defunding. To me, that's a watershed moment. It's a defining moment in President Nichols' um, uh, life at the university. Um, previous presidents have also had those moments. Uh, Tom Buchanan had that moment with Bill Ayers. Um, and we know what happened there, right? He, he, he buckled, on, and, and there's very good reasons, right? It's tough, and I understand that it's tough. Um, to sort of have that integrity and courage um, to stand up to that sort of political pressure when the university is that dependent upon state funding. But we now have that moment with President Nichols. She's talked the talk. Um, the question is going to be, will the institution walk the walk? And what will be said with regard to the protection of academic freedom, particularly around this recent incident? Dr. Lockwood, it's been a pleasure. The book is a good read, especially for those of us who have grown up here in Wyoming, and we appreciate your time here on Wyoming Chronicle. Well, thank you for having me, and I should say, if it's painful to read, it was painful to write. I can imagine. We do want to get the university's response, though, and up next we'll visit with Chris Boswell, who is the Vice President for Governmental and Community Affairs. He's next. Stay with us. Chris Boswell now joins us on Wyoming Chronicle. Chris is the UW Vice President for Government and Community Affairs. Chris, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Good to be with you. Chris, you also were Governor Friedenthal's Chief of Staff for eight years, also a former legislator. You've had a chance to read Dr. Lockwood's book. Let's start with generally, what is your response? What are your thoughts? Well, I, I, I thought it, uh, uh, I enjoyed the read. Uh, even though there's, uh, there's uh, uh, some pretty significant criticism of the university and folks in, in Wyoming, but I, I, I really did enjoy it. And I took uh, Dr. Lockwood's uh, uh, closing sentiments to heart, which were uh, to some degree to, to share the discussion, uh, uh, share the book, uh, which I've done, and to, to m make sure that folks are aware that there are pressures uh, 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 
relating to uh, controversial issues in Wyoming, and it's good to have uh, discussion about them, and it's good to talk about those pressures. He, the pressures, of course, he, he talks about limiting free speech and the free expression of speech here on campus. Um, do you believe there is a culture that feels that pressure either directly or indirectly that does limit free speech here at the University of Wyoming? My guess is that there are certain people that do believe that there is that pressure being exerted upon them. I would answer that uh, uh, that pressure exists on any campus in the United States that, that deals with funding that is not entirely self-generated. Uh, and so uh, whether it be uh, the University of Texas or Berkeley or MIT, there's always a need to be aware of uh, uh, funding. Uh, there's always the pursuit of funding. Uh, it's particularly acute in Wyoming because we are reliant on the, on the state of Wyoming for such a very significant portion of our budget. So I think it just makes sense that people at the university are aware of the, the, the state economy, the state legislature, the reactions from people in the state. It doesn't mean you have to temper your, your research or your views. But I think it's, it's uh, somewhat disingenuous to think that someone should be able to speak out on controversial issues and have no reaction. Of course there will be reactions, and so of course there's a need to be aware of those reactions. Dr. Lockwood would say that it's not good enough, I, I think, that to be cognizant that it exists not only at the University of Wyoming but elsewhere. Who is the champion of free speech here at the University of Wyoming? More than likely, I think there are two, and, and actually I think that the, those champions exist all over campus. But certainly uh, uh, the president, the provost, are, are there to uh, defend free speech on the part of uh, the academics and the researchers that are, that are working here at the university. And I'd like to think that the Board of Trustees would also stand up for that free speech. In taking quotes from the book, Capstone courses have been eviscerated because of pressures from um, the, universe, uh, the pressures from the en energy industry, and those um, issues that affect the energy industry's bottom line aren't discussed or researched like perhaps they should be at a public university. Do you agree with that perspective? Absolutely not. Uh, I was just uh, attending an, a, a, a ceremony today, a luncheon uh, honoring the outstanding. UW graduates, uh, the Tobin Spitaleri Awards that were offered today. And one of the students was cited for his research and his participation in research uh, uh, having to do with climate change. And that was being celebrated at, a, at an awards uh, luncheon. Um, I, I, I simply believe that some of this concern uh, approaches the subject from one perspective and that perspective to, to a great degree is that corporations are bad, minerals are bad, and therefore uh, associations with energy, uh, uh, the energy industry is somehow flawed uh, 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 on the part of the university. And my argument would be that in fact there's a desire on the part of the university to be actively involved with the players in the Wyoming economy. That's the function of a land grant institution. And so when Dr. Lockwood in his book approaches uh, the subject from a perspective that there's a problem if there is uh, uh, a relationship with uh, uh, BP, for example, uh, I, I would argue that, that uh, that's a, a fairly one-dimensional view of that relationship. He cites in his book and talks about what amounts to an exodus of faculty here at the university and attributes it to their fear of censorship. Um, what's your perspective about his comments relative to the, the faculty who are leaving the university, perhaps outside of budget constraints that are affecting the university? I'm not going to let you take that out. Uh, uh, Craig, I'm going to say that the budget considerations will play a role in, in uh, turnover of faculty here. In fact, it's the, the university's position through the Voluntary Separation Incentive Program to actually encourage uh, retirements uh, by uh, certain faculty. It's a fact of life that we have to be leaner at this institution and one of the least painful ways of, of becoming leaner is to offer uh, re uh, separation incentives probably in the retirement realm to faculty and others. So we are in fact doing that. We're doing it quite publicly. 
Is there the possibility that, that uh, faculty are leaving for greener pastures for multiple reasons? Yes, uh, of, of course that's a possibility. But the fact that there have been very limited pay increases in recent years adds to this. The fact that the, the state's coffers aren't particularly healthy at this point, and perhaps faculty don't see uh, the opportunities for compensation and, and research enterprises that, to the degree that they might like, they might be tempted to, it might add to the consideration of whether a faculty member stays or goes. We just have a few seconds left, um, Chris, and we appreciate your coming and, and visiting with us um, here on Wyoming Chronicle. To some, it's your position that there really isn't a censorship problem here at the University of Wyoming. Is that accurate? Yes. Either directly or indirectly? Yes, I believe that is accurate, although there is the need to recognize that uh, one needs to be aware that one's comments and one's research will be consumed, will be heard and consumed. To, note, to imagine that they will have no impact is, is, to me, unfortunate. People should react, and sometimes people will react positively and sometimes negatively. To the extent that it impacts funding, how concerned are you that it might do that? Uh, well, I spend all my time worrying about funding, or at least a good part of my time worrying about funding. Uh, and so it, I, I think it would be healthy for the folks at the university to understand that if you stand on a chair and, and shake your fist at Cheyenne, that uh, perhaps Cheyenne, uh, meaning the legislature, might not say, I'm, I'm going to warmly embrace uh, funding proposals for the University of Wyoming. There's a give and take in this circumstance that's inevitable. And you're, in your view, those two can't be separated? I think folks just have to recognize them and be realistic about it. Chris, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you.